You're listening to Crazy Shit in Real Estate. You'll be amazed at all these wild but true situations that others have found themselves in. Because on this show, you'll hear uncensored, unbelievable stories from the world of real estate. I'm Lee Brown. Let's dive right in. I'm Lee Brown. This is Crazy Shit in Real Estate. And today we've got Rich and Jones, and he's rich and famous on Instagram, which I freaking love. When somebody can do a play on their name, it's so amazing. But oh my gosh, beyond the fun name, this is one smart dude. So get your notebooks and pencils handy because you're going to pick up some great information here about investing and frankly, just about life. So enjoy the conversation and I'll see you on the other side. Hello, hello. Hello. Good morning. How are you? Well, I'm good, but now you're going to have to help straighten out my brain. Is it in lease? And so what's the connection? Oh, is it showing? Oh, let me change the name here real quick here. Richin. Richin. So my LLC and my business is Rich and Famous Real Estate, which is how people remember it. I don't know why my wife's name popped up there. So Rich and we Rich and Famous. All right. Yeah, that's really, I mean, it's been butchered for 41 years, but that's how people remember it is. I don't you, know, Rich and Famous Real Estate. Yeah, ah, I can get that. Fast that. and the Furious behind you. Why is that behind you? Do you like that? Oh, that's, I'm a big Fast and Furious franchise buffs. My brother got me that for Christmas one year. It's the last one that Paul Walker was in before he passed away. So he, they all signed it and everything. Also, those are real signatures, not oh, just those are real. Money. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Those are real signatures from all the actors. Well, that was pretty cool. That's a good present. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Tell my viewers a little bit about you now that they know how to say rich. And we're going to guess Annalise is your wife. Annalise is my wife, and she teaches school classes on Zoom. So sometimes we get mixed up, I guess. So, yeah, we live in the Salt Lake area, and we're not from here. I'm from Oregon and grew up there, and we went there after college. and. I was not in real estate. I was a financial advisor for 12 years. I loved your episode with Sarah a couple of weeks ago. She was spot on so many things. And I was just shaking my head going, uh-huh. I hope more people are listening to this. But just got to a place. I worked with my father and that's always interesting working with family. And just got to a place where we were like, you know what? It's time to do something different. I'm 35 years old. It's time to figure out what I want to do with my life when I grow up. And and uh, real estate was a natural fit. I you know, love the numbers and the data and the Whole client experience and everything else. And, you know, there were some drawbacks I, I was finding in the, you know, the stock and bond and CD world that real estate can solve. Again, not a financial advisor, not licensed, but there's some value to real estate and financial planning, obviously. And uh, so we moved here to Utah and that was about five and a half years ago. And here we are. Real estate changed my life and I love it. And I eat, sleep and breathe it and love everything about it. So did you let your series seven go? Cause I let mine go. My seven, my 65, my 66, my insurance license. I let it all go. In fact, I couldn't have both licenses activated at the same time. And so... Really? uh, What's that? We weren't an RIA. We worked for a a firm. And so they were like, no, real estate's unlicensed security. So you can't even say real estate if you're not an RIA. So... Which I wasn't too sad to let it go. It was fine. Well, you know, the, I wasn't sad to let... I had the 763, 65, and I wasn't sad to let it go at that time. But now that I want to talk about financial things, I kind of <laughs> wish I still had it because I'm probably getting yeah. this all the time. But so you've had a lot of history in the financial markets as well. Do you look at our overall economic space with a sense of why the hell have the wheels not fallen off the bus yet? Because it just feels like the fundamentals are so out of whack. I feel like we're propped up on toothpicks. Do you feel that way ever? Yeah, at times. Look, I, I lived through the recession as a financial advisor. You know, when people were calling us going, how bad is it? Oh, oh you're I was down. Real estate at that time. And yeah. I just said, stay in your house because you're underwater. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you tell people, oh, you're down 35, 40%. And they, and they literally would say, oh my gosh, that's so great. I thought it was so much worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. And as I look at it right now, I don't think it's the same because people's their stocks and their bonds account, like that's the retirement, right? Like they need it. They're doing all sorts of calculations for how much income can I take at retirement or in retirement or you know, whatever it is. For a lot of people, their house is like, okay, their house values go up and down. But if like no one's forcing you to move and you don't have to move, it's gonna be okay. Particularly if you took a long-term view going into it. Now I get that life happens and sometimes you have to move and sell or buy or whatever it is, and that then becomes a little more problematic. But I don't see as as a quite the widespread problem of everybody's 401k dropping and being cut in half. And now I got to add 10 years retirement. Well, I mean, even if your 401k drops, though, you probably say the same thing I always said, which is you're not retiring today, but staring at it. It doesn't matter yeah. because it is cyclical. Mm-hmm. I just found it to be a, a very weird market. So I've got a very good eye on buying more doors because I would much rather have real estate than equities right now. Although my bond portfolio yeah. is looking better. <laughs> 
I mean, I'll tell you, like, again, not a financial advisor and everybody's situation is different. Let's just get that out there. Contact when they had, your own financial advisor or tax yeah, attorney. We are not hire like, them all. Yes. Asterisks. <laughs> but during COVID, like they had that exemption where you could pull money out of your retirement accounts, your IRA accounts, and still pay the income tax over three years, but avoid the 10% early withdrawal penalty. Lee, I pulled every dollar and put it into real estate because that's the lane I'm in. That's the lane I understand. It's the lane I watch every day. And for me, it was like, I feel like that's a better place for me to be. So I, I pulled every dollar. That's when I started investing in my own investment properties. So do y'all invest in the Salt Lake area, in Utah, or just wherever you feel like the fundamentals are good? I feel like for Utah at the time, the fundamentals were very good. 2020, 2021, um, the numbers worked. Utah, Salt Lake area, we have a housing shortage issue. Like I know it, there are many areas do. We have so many people moving here that when builders stop getting permits and stop building, we're still catching up from the recession. And we caught up a little bit the last couple of years. Building has been going, it's been booming here. But man, like there's just so many more people here than there is housing units available that for me, just starting out, I wasn't super comfortable going across the country or somewhere else. Like I wanted to be able to drive by the property. I don't manage them myself. I'm also not a property manager. I make more money selling houses than managing them, collecting rent. Um, Yes. But I wanted to be able to have something to you know feel, touch, drive by, and else I have five kids, and at some point they might want to stick around, and I mean, I'm I'm going to charge them rent just like charge everybody else rent. But at least I'll have a place if you know not my own house if they want to stick around. So yeah, I stayed local, but those fundamentals have changed drastically with the increase in price point in our local area as well as the interest rates. I still think there's opportunities all over the place. In fact, I've seen more really, really good opportunities in the last six months than in the last couple of years. But with the price point, it can be difficult for a lot of people in our local market because of different down payments that you might need depending on how you're going to do it. So now you moved in from Oregon. So you're one of those transplants. What other areas are feeding into Salt Lake City? Is it primarily coming out of a high tax environment like California? Or is it people coming from Idaho that have a similar geography to Utah? They just want more jobs. Where are you seeing that influx? Good question. California gets a bad rap. They've earned California it. Gets- there. They've earned it. <laughs> As far as the locals, California gets a bad rap of, of as far as people itself has made bad decisions with property rights. Absolutely. I guess from the standpoint of the rising prices here locally, Californians get a bad rap as far as you know they're coming with their magical bags of cash and offering you know fifty thousand dollars over whatever and whatever it is. So we do have people coming from California. We have people from Colorado. We have Nevada. We have Arizona, Idaho. We kind of go back and forth. Yeah, Arizona. I people went to Arizona as snowbirds, but Arizonans are coming to Utah. Oh, I go to Arizona because we're about two weeks away from being cold here. And so, but yeah, it's surrounding communities, surrounding states, I guess I should say. We have a booming tech market and the Silicon Slopes is about 15 minutes south of me here. And so a lot of the tech jobs that are coming in are bringing in people from California, especially, but other areas that have picked up a move because of their local tax situation on business or locals, you know, residency in both cases. Well, how did y'all pick Salt Lake out of all the places you could have moved <laughs> after Oregon? Why Salt Lake? My wife has family here, extended family here. When we felt like it was time to move and we felt like we're people of faith and we put prayer into that, we felt like Utah was the right place. And immediately we thought, oh, great. St. George. We love St. George. St. George is on the border. If you don't know where St. George, it's yeah. not really a resort community, but beautiful, warm. We vacationed there. We're like, oh, St. George, that's let's go. And the more we thought about that, we're like, ah, that doesn't feel quite right. And so we decided on Salt Lake. Now we live about 25 minutes south of Salt Lake in one of the suburbs there. And we've moved here and we love it. We're 10 minutes from the mountains, from the hikes. We're kind of up above the inversion when that happens. What's and the inversion? Dirty air that just sort of settles in the valley. Oh. Or you can't see across the valley because it's just smoggy air that gets trapped because of the pressure and things like Utah? that. Again, that California gets the credit for that, but that happens in Utah too. It does. It does. It gets trapped by, I don't know, not a physicist either or a meteorologist, but well, it gets trapped. Confidence. I'll believe you because I don't have it here. So whatever you say, <laughs> I believe. Basically, the dirty air gets trapped because of mm-hmm. pressure or whatever else. And so we're up a little bit above that. So <laughs> anyway, we, we love it here. My kids have flourished here. Real estate has changed my life, my family's life here. And so we ended up here and we don't regret it a single day. Well, if I had five kids, I would do everything to be near family as well, because it's not just helpful to y'all as parents. It's so good for them to have that extended feeling of community. But I want to hear more about how you say real estate's changed your life. What causes you to say that? And and how did so you get into I would, the business anyway? How did I get into the business? Yeah. I, I think I kind of fell into it. I was the one in Oregon, always watching my property value on Zillow, right? 
just always watching what's going on in my neighborhood. I love the numbers and the data crunching and the metrics and things like that. I was doing that anyway, you know, just different assets. And so I knew when it was time to move and it was time to stop working with dad and things like that, that I wanted to do real estate. So I got my real estate license, moved to Utah, and I loved what I was doing to a point. But financially, I wasn't building my own book of clients. I really was working with my dad and working with his clients who I love. But I mean, I'll be very transparent here. I was capping out at 55 grand a year after 12 years with a base and a bonus, basically. And there were all sorts of benefits and healthcare and insurance and things like that. But it just came to a place where I felt like I needed to take more control of my own life financially and for my family. And so we got the safety net. We burned the bridges, not relationship wise, but with the job and the benefits, everything else, the salary, we burned the bridges, burned the boats and said, we're going to make this happen. I personally knew outside of my wife's family, and there's like three realtors in my wife's family. So like, although I have taken some business from family now, I knew a half dozen people here in Utah. Like I didn't know anybody here. And so it was really starting over and just starting from scratch and grinding and figuring out how to talk to people about real estate and creating that sort of that identity of rich in the real estate professional and just learning what to say and when to say it and giving people a really good experience. And the financial is a byproduct of it, of what we do, right? Like if we do a good job, it happens, it comes, it's nice. But I have developed more close and deep relationships here in the last five years than probably the first 36 years of my life. I think that's been the most rewarding part of it is my phone is full of people I've been able to help buy and sell houses or guide to do something else or whatever it is with their life, real estate wise. And again, the money is a byproduct of that. It's great. But my bucket is so much more full because I get to go out, even in what our current environment is here, I get to go out and help people solve problems that they wake up in the morning going, I have no idea what to do here. I'm in the wrong house. I have to move. My job's going to relocate me. How in the world do I navigate interest rates? We get to get up and help people solve those problems every day. And that's, I love it. It's so fulfilling. The comment you made that is sitting here, like sitting on my shoulder is when you talked about cutting the safety net. And when we talk to a lot of new realtors, to them, cutting the safety net is leaving the salary job to go into real estate. For you, it was leaving the job with the income and changing markets entirely. So when you cut the safety net, you didn't have a community of built-in contacts already. Mm -hmm. You didn't have a built-in knowledge of the real estate market. So you have to go out and hustle and learn the market while you're building contacts, while you're trying to provide for your family. How did you get over the fear of failure? Because obviously that's something that you're a man, you want to provide for your family. The fear can't help but get in there. How do you push it back so you could get out there and yeah. succeed? At that point, we had four kids. So a wife and four kids and a mortgage it's pretty you're motivating. Just make another kid. Okay, I got you on that. Yeah, we have one that was born in Utah. It's uh, there's a lot of sleepless nights, and there's a lot of if you're a person of faith, a lot of time on my knees, a lot of tears being shed, a lot of conversations with my wife going like, "Hey, I don't know how this is going to go. I just need a hug. I just need some support right now." But also, a friend of a friend introduced me to what became my real estate mentor. He allowed me to join his team. He was not looking to add people to his team. As I interviewed different brokerages and different team leaders, I didn't know what I was doing. Didn't know what to ask. I mean, I had a real estate license, wasn't activated. And everybody wanted to tell me how much money I was going to make as a first year agent, as a second year agent. And I finally told one broker who bless his heart, he's, he's a friend now. I told him, look, I don't have a lot of stars in my eyes when you tell me that because I'm living on 50 grand a year right now. Like It doesn't take much for me to you know, survive financially here. And when I went to meet with Brian, we had a little phone call initially and he, I came in and he said, I'm just going to ask you a question. So well, that's why I'm here. He said, how much money do you have in the bank right now? Oh, and I just sat with that for a minute. I was like, I've known this guy 35 seconds. He's asking about my bank account. <laughs> and he says, the reason I'm asking you that is he's like, and I do want an answer. He said, but the reason I'm asking you that is we do things a little differently here. We don't buy leads. We don't provide leads. What I can teach you is how to build relationships and I can teach you what to say. I said, but that's a long, slow process. And I can't have you panicking if you're not getting a deal in the first 30 days. And you start chasing transactions and you start pressuring people to do. I said, okay. So I answered the question. He said, good. Now, what questions do you have for me? <laughs> what a wonderful way to start off the yes. conversation though. Because now you know you're with a guy who values the humans, which you just said was the biggest benefit of getting into this business. And so Absolutely. the connection makes sense. Yeah. And for the next four years, we worked together. I feel like I got a four-year degree in relationship-based real estate. We actually just did our first deal together last week. 
I'm on my own now. We're best friends. But that conversation, I think back to and think that conversation was so much different than everybody else I was talking to. That I was like, yes, that is what I want to do. I don't just want to sling houses. I am the world's worst salesperson. I don't want to knock doors or cold call or I don't even want to do open houses. I don't do well talking to people for 30 seconds trying to like, you know, sell something. I want to sit across the table. I want to get to know you, what's important to you. I want to get to know your kids and your family. And we're not going to like hang out on weekends necessarily, although, you know, we can go golf together or something. But like, I want to get to know you as a person. And I need some space and some time to do that. That's what Brian taught me when he was teaching me how to do real estate was under that context. And it's it's made all the difference. I bet your response is a little different if they have a teenage girl of babysitting age. Just going to point that. (laughs) Might be well. We we, we like those. Are you a real estate professional and struggling to make videos? I know. I know you're watching mine because that's easier than making your own. But you really do wish you had your own YouTube channel and you wish that phone would ring and you would not have to go out and like people that you don't like online. You'd rather have them talk to you or do you have a YouTube channel and the videos aren't doing anything and you don't know how they're missing the mark and you haven't found those amazing neighbors who really would love you? Well, you should know that my friend Karen Carr, she teaches you how to make your YouTube videos a true evergreen sales funnel. She will teach you how to make videos that are simple. Aha! You don't have to start from scratch. She will give you the framework. You don't need bells and whistles. You don't need a big fancy videographer. And the best part is the framework she gives you gets prospects in your zip code calling you when they're ready to buy or sell. And that doesn't happen just today. It happens for the long haul because YouTube is an evergreen strategy. And here's the craziest part about it. She kicks this off with a three-day challenge. So you can carve out three days and it's not the whole day, by the way. It's just a little bit of time and three days in a row. The cost is $27, so nine and nine and nine, or basically because of inflation, a pumpkin spice latte, a pumpkin spice latte, and a pumpkin spice latte. So in exchange for three of your overpriced, amazing, yummy fall beverages, you could get all the information you need to jack your business for next year. She'll teach you how to set the channel up. She'll teach you how to get viewers to stay with you once they find you. She'll teach you where to do the research, which is probably the best thing I learned from her, to be honest. And She's going to teach you how to make videos that actually create conversation. And all of this is going to jack you in Google without spending a lot of money on Google AdSense. Shh, don't tell Google I said that. But what you should know is that this hot deal challenge right here, 27 bucks, three days with more information than you can shake a stick at, is at videobossagent.com slash Lee Brown because that's a special deal for y'all. So video boss agent. So V-I-D-E-O-B-O-S-S agent.com slash Lee Brown, one word to get signed up. I've taken the class more than once. I'm promising y'all it is absolutely worth it. And if you're looking for the answer to make 2024 a different kind of real estate business, this is exactly where you want to be. I'll see you there. Okay. So I'm just, I'm just taking some notes here because I love the angle Brian took with you. So you said that when you were talking to brokers and team leaders, trying to find that place, you didn't know what to ask. Now mm-hmm. that you've been in the business, for a few years, you're starting to build up that base of repeat business and your name is starting to grow. If somebody is early career and they're trying to interview brokers and team leaders, what do you wish you'd known then to ask that you would definitely ask now if you were back in that interview spot? I love that. I have clients now asking me, hey, like I want to get into real estate. What should you ask? Yeah. So no, I treat it just like Brian taught me how to do real estate. I start asking him, Lee, like, what's the most important to you about getting to real estate? Like, what's this going to do for your life that you can't do right now? And I think it really depends on what they're looking for. If they just want to get their license and flip houses, like, that's a totally different conversation than, hey, I've been in a sales position, you know, whatever. It depends on where they're coming from. If they really want to put the time in to build the relationships, then I'm going to tell them, look, like, maybe you're not looking for a leads based team where, no offense, I mean, everybody does real estate differently. But if they're just giving you leads one after another and you're supposed to churn through them, you know, you're just making calls nine to noon every day, that's gonna be a different environment than I'll use Brian's example. Hey, I need you to go to lunch with two people a week. Be mm-hmm. thinking, I only know six people in this entire state. How am I gonna find two people a week to go to lunch with? But then you start figuring out how to talk to people. Essentially, the question is, you know, who do you know that I can talk to without actually saying that question? Because no one loves that question. No one loves to be asked that question, but it changes your mindset. So what do I tell somebody is I would want to understand first, what are they looking for? What's important to them? What's their goal? 
And it's no different when they're buying real estate, right? We're asking the same questions, trying to get the same sort of clarity. But then I can help them say, well, if you're looking for, hey, you're great on the phone, you can do sales, then great. You're going to go probably ask this team, how many leads a week am I going to get? And what did that look like? And how many of them are warm? And what's your conversion rate? Whatever it is. And if it's, I just want to learn what to say and know when to say it, then let's go figure out a team that's going to be, you know, put a warm blanket around you, be there, support you. You got to go kill what you eat. You got to go find your own people to talk to, but we can teach you what to say when you find those people and have a conversation with them. And by the way, for those of y'all that are watching and listening and trying to figure out how in the world you're going to afford two lunches a week in an inflationary environment, my extra secret advice here is take them to breakfast because breakfast is the cheapest meal to buy for somebody during the day. And especially if you're a business person, it's got a hard stop to it. So you don't have to sit there for 47 hours chit chatting if you're not a chit chatter. So that's amazing advice. And also you find out if you tell people you're willing to take them to eat, your contact list will grow substantially and rather fast. Because it's so funny you said that. I had a breakfast meeting last week with somebody and we went to this little restaurant. We each got the French toast and it was like with tip, like 12 bucks at the end. I was like, this is great. Like I can do this. <laughs> like, oh, it's 830. I got to go. And nobody yep. fights you. Whereas yep. if you go to cocktails at 430, they want to stay all night if they're a chit chatter extrovert. So this is also if you're an introvert like me. Lean on the breakfast idea. Uh, okay. I, so anyway, Rich, and you're giving all kinds of gems here. And it's such good counsel for people changing markets or trying to figure out where they should be as the market shifts, because our markets are shifting right now. We don't know if they're going to stay sideways, go up, go down. Who knows? Everything is happening at the same time. But regardless, where you've landed is going to be a big part of your success. So now that you have moved out and you're doing more of the rich in thing and less of what Brian has taught you. What have you seen as your biggest opportunity being out on your own now? Is it being being more visible with your clients so you can grow your market share? Is it recruiting? Is it something else? It's a great question. I loved my four years with Brian and it changed my life. I think what I have found most in the last year and a half since then is I found my own voice. I've had to market myself. We had incredible marketing gal on our team that our marketing was great. Our events were Top notch. We had everything in place. It was plug and play. It was great. I've been able to find my own voice as far as who am I? What value do I bring to people? And for me, that is the investment space. A lot of my clients are investors. A lot of my clients are accidental investors because they were first time buyers 2018, 2019, 2020 that now are like, what do I do? And you're like, please do not sell that house. Please do not ever sell. You're at a two and a half rate, a $1,200 payment. You can rent cash flow for that. Please do not sell that house. I've talked three of them out of it this year. Um, Good job. <laughs> I've been able to find my own voice, my own lane, if you will, of being able to do real estate the way I want to do it and be able to be more visible in the community, our real estate community as a CE instructor or as I don't ever really want to be a coach, but a resource to people who say, Hey, like I see you being a little more visible now and things like that. And and so that's I found my space, I guess, found my lane to be able to really run with it. And I feel like it's kind of a unique lane. There's lots of people who do investments and lots of people do various things, but I feel like I've got a unique approach and unique skill set to where I can be that resource to people. Well, and you can come at it from that diversification standpoint of you're not against equities and you're not against real estate because we find that a lot of real estate investment type coaches are exclusively real estate. And so many people in the CFP world and that financial space just blow off real estate altogether because they're all equities. And it's just a beautiful crossover that you can provide to people to help them think through what their plan should look like. Well, and I can tell the agent, hey, before you advise your client, go take $100,000 from their stock portfolio to buy this house, you might want to make a phone call to their financial advisor or else you're going to be doing this the rest of the relationship rather than, hey, let's all work together here to make sure Susie Q is on the right path financially. I mean, as a financial advisor, I got a couple of those calls every once in a while from a real estate agent. There was nothing better because we weren't caught off guard. We could work together rather than that stupid real estate agent. They're taking my money. What are they telling them? And, you know, they're telling them I'm doing a bad job. You know, all this, the stories start going in our head, but there really is an opportunity for us to do that. I think that's where those are the conversations to be had as well with agents. Okay. So considering all of those pieces, obviously the premise of the show is the crazy things that we've seen in and around real estate. And so I can only imagine that having come from financial services, from working with dad to a new state with a pack of kids, 
a wife depending on you, a great team, and now you're solo. You've got a thousand different buckets from which to pull. So I can't wait to know what story you brought with you today. So here it is. I'm one of five siblings myself. We're a very competitive family. We all started running together in about 2009. So we ran races. Don't finish last, right? Don't finish last in the local two and a half mile 4th of July race. Don't finish last. We played Monopoly growing up. Don't finish last. <laughs> we got together for a family reunion in August and it was like, hey, are we doing this? And they're like, oh, we're doing it. We're playing. And a couple of siblings and their spouse are like, I don't really want to play. It doesn't really end up being a good... Ex- you're playing. You're playing. You're not going to whine about it. And don't be the first one out. So the story is literally everything I know or need to know about real estate, whether it's investing in real estate or buying a primary residence, I learned by playing Monopoly as a kid. I'll give you four examples. I can give you four four lessons from that. Yes. First one is this. You got to know the rules. Got to know the rules of the game. I'll use real estate as, as an example here. There are rules that are changing. We're recording on October 20th. There are rules that are changing in November that are going to allow people to put down 5% on a two, three, or four unit property through fan. The rules are changing, but you got to know the rules so you know how to play within them to your advantage, right? We could go on all sorts of other examples. That's most on my mind because I love my first-time home buyers and FHA homes that can now stay in their FHA home and go buy a multifamily and owner occupy it. That's just that. So second thing is you can't be afraid to invest. If you just go around the board at Monopoly and you're afraid to buy anything, guess what happens as the game goes along? You just start paying money out to everybody else the entire game. This is your rent, your renters for life, right? They're like, I'm going to wait for the market to crash or whatever else. They're just going to keep paying rent to everybody as the game goes along. The third one is you have to think long term. Which goes without saying in real estate, real estate is not where do I want to go to lunch today? It's, you know, it's a big investment. You know, you're going to own that thing for a 30 year note, probably, and whatever else. So you have to think long term. And then the fourth one is location matters. I mean, we could go through the statistical, this is my nerd coming in, my numbers nerd coming out, but the statistical probability in which properties are statistically the best to own in Monopoly, it's the orange properties, by the way. I was going to guess New York because I always land on New York. There's a reason for that, right? Everybody goes to jail and gets out of jail. There's an advance of St. Charles Place card. Okay. On that end of the board, you roll a six, seven, eight, nine, which is the most rolled dice numbers. You land on the orange property. Does it go back three spaces if you land on the community chest in red? I love Monopoly, by the way. Anyway, the orange properties are statistically the best properties for the value for the price, and they get landed on the most. So location does matter. So I'll run through those again. You got to know the rules so you can play within them to your advantage. You can't be afraid to invest. You got to think long term, and location absolutely matters. Everything I need to know about real estate or investing in real estate, I learned from Monopoly. And that's what I tell people. I taught this to a group of teenagers last week in their school class, 13, 14, 15 year olds. We're talking about real estate and we're talking about building credit scores and how to buy a house. And really, like we just talked about Monopoly for an hour and a half because everybody gets Monopoly. So that's where I come from with how I approach real estate. So you know that's one of the big initiatives for the National Association of Realtors in 2024 is financial education. Mm -hmm. You need to go to nar.realtor and put your name on that list so you can be one of the people logging credits for teaching those classes because the goal is if there's 30,000 high schools in the United States, that if we can get a realtor in each one of them giving some kind of financial literacy, we could set the next generation up for success. Hopefully. Yeah, I'll take a look at that. I'm going to go click that button because I love that. But by the way, North Carolina is a green one. And it does not get landed on, <laughs> but I love it. I'll have to buy it because, you know, that's like yeah. a home square and I never get rent for it ever. And that's okay though, right? Sometimes you just want to buy a property because it's, I you love it. it, right? Yeah. And people buy second homes on a lake, not because they cash flow, because they're like, you know what? I just want to go up to the lake a couple <laughs> times a year. Like, that's okay. That's okay. Look long term, you know, know how you're going to do it, know the rules of financing and how you can make it to your advantage, but that's okay. I love it. Rich, and I hope you put together a whole CE class on Monopoly and, what it's taught you it, about real it's, estate. It's in the works. It's in all the right. works. Because that sounds like one that I would totally take. And I feel <laughs> like all the other agents would. So if somebody's looking so, for a real estate contact in Salt Lake, they want to find out about this Monopoly CE class when it comes out, what's the best way for somebody to contact Richin? So the easiest way to find me for everything is on Instagram at Richin Famous, R Y C H E N. F-A-M-O-U-S, Rich and Famous. Rich and Famous Real Estate is my LLC. My Instagram is Strictly Business. So that's where all the business stuff is. There's a link tree address there with the YouTube channel and the podcast and all the other links. If you want to follow me on Facebook, I'm a little more selective about that because that has business and personal on it. But Instagram is the best place to go to then you know connect you to everything else. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and giving us a thousand different little angles to consider today. That's my favorite kind of conversation is somebody who's willing to share 
especially when it's a lot of things that make other people better. So we really appreciate you. And thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right, people say something nice about Richard in the comments or encourage him to have baby number six so that he can have a half dozen. <laughs> Make sure you subscribe for more and come back and see us over here on Crazy Shit. As always, I'm so super thrilled that you joined in for more Crazy Shit. And if you're a realtor, investor, inspector, lender, or just a regular human being who happens to have an unbelievable story that you need to tell the world about, or frankly, you just need to one up the story you just heard, then make sure to DM me on Instagram at Lee Thomas Brown or tweet me at Lee Brown or frankly, any social network where you hang out. I'm there. And if you have some fun, then you totally won't just subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes.